When I was in high school, I had a crush on a, a girl named Sue. Now, I never was brave enough to actually ask her out on a date. Uh, that's because I was a tall, very skinny kid with red hair and a little bit of an acne problem. And Sue was a vivacious, cute cheerleader. And, well, I don't want you to think I was like a total dork or something. I, I had friends. Um, I, I got good grades. I never got in trouble. And I was very accomplished on the French horn. <laughs> but that's not exactly the same as being the football hero or the star of the basketball team. So I just figured there's no way I could compete on the cheerleader level. Um, then a couple of years ago, I went to my high school reunion. And Sue was there, and we talked for a while, and, and she got around to asking me a question. She said, how come you never took me out in high school? And I went, uh, well, I kind of figured you were busy. <laughs> you know, had lots of dates, and you know, I couldn't exactly compete. And she said, oh, come on. I never got asked out. I would have loved to go out with you. This was a bit of a surprise. Um, it, it, it's not like it was some big romantic tragedy. I, I met another girl in high school, and we've been happily married for 35 years, so things have worked out. But talking to her did make, make me think about the different ways that your life can go and how little things can change it. And, you know, what if I dated her? What, would we have fallen in love? Would we have gotten married? Well, the answer is no, because back then, I believed in the myth of cheerleaders, and my perception didn't align with what apparently was the reality. Now, you know, we all know this. Our, our perceptions are what guide us through life, what direct us. The way we see the world and other people, that's how we make our choices. And a lot of the time, well, we're wrong. Now, there's nothing very profound about that. It's a pretty obvious thing. But if it's so obvious, why is it that a lot of us hang on to perceptions that are demonstrably not true. Now, we all do this, and it's not just high school kids, and it goes to the very top. It includes world leaders. Now, I want to give you a dramatic example of that. A guy named Nikita Khrushchev. He was the premier of the Soviet Union, or you remember the Soviet Union, uh, back in the 50s and early 60s. And in 1961, he met John F. Kennedy in Vienna for a summit, a summit meeting. And after that, he went back to Moscow and he wrote these words. I know for certain that Kennedy doesn't have a strong backbone, nor generally speaking does he have the courage to stand up to a challenge. So Khrushchev, with that perception of Kennedy, had this provocative idea, which was to put nuclear missiles in Cuba 90 miles from the American coast. This, as we all know, led to a confrontation between the United States and the USSR, and 13 days of terror for the world. It's the closest we've ever come to annihilation as a species. And a lot of it had to do simply with Khrushchev's perception of Kennedy. Now, most of us are not going to come up with any misperception that's quite that dramatic or earth-shaking or earth-threatening, but we do get into trouble with our false perceptions. I, my, my son's mother-in-law tells a story um, about uh, an incident a few years ago. She was driving down a country road and a, another car was coming her way and there were a bunch of kids in it and one of them leaned out the car and said, cow! And she, she was deeply offended. Uh, and she turned around and yelled something at them and then she turned back just in time to hit the big cow that was in the middle of the road. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is something that starts, you know, when we are kids trying to figure out the world, uh, figure out, figuring, out things, figuring out things that our parents are telling us, like, like this kid, dad's talking, son, no matter what they teach you in your science class, remember, man was created in God's image. <laughs> now, Metaphysically speaking, this, this may explain that question. You always say, why are there terrible things that happen in the world? Where is God? Well, he's in a 
Barco lounger. Um, <laughs> now, we all, once we're adults, have a bundle of perceptions that we, we've developed, and some of them we hang on to no matter what the, the evidence shows otherwise, and this too gets us in trouble. Uh, let me show you a couple of guys who um, are this way. The, the first one is a guy who so wants the world to be one way that, that he just doesn't want to let certain difficult realities get in the way of it. Fellow animal, I am Hugo Flea Lover, animal rights crusader, come to free you from bondage. <laughs> you know, sometimes reality really does bite. Um, now, the second guy is on a beach, and this is in the future, the year 2053. Nice little tropical scene, and he's complaining. I don't care what they say, this global warming scare is just a bunch of loony, left-wing, environmentalist, anti-growth hype. So, is this your first winter here in Juneau? <laughs> you know, guys like that are just predisposed to believe any conspiracy theory or, or crazy thing they hear on talk radio, as long as it reinforces what they already believe. And the curse of the internet age is that we can now all kind of band together in cozy little communities of like-minded people and never really have our ideas challenged. Um, you know, th there's a price though for that kind of isolation and that price is something called paranoia. Um, for instance, this, this family in the heartland responding to the results of the 2008 presidential election. Dad saying, looks like that black Muslim terrorist fella is gonna be president. They'll be coming to take away our guns. They'll close all the churches. And the boy says, whoopee. <laughs> What'd you say, boy? Nothing, I just think church is boring. Well, now, the problem with these folks is they bought into trumped up fears. The things they were worrying about were not real, but it distracted them from the things that they should be worrying about, the big cow in the road. And you know, when that happens, well, here's the result. Yes, kids, a, a few years ago, we were freaked out if a politician didn't wear a flag pin on his lapel, lapel and frightened of swarthy strangers boarding airplanes. Nobody was worried about bankers bundling bad mortgages. <laughs> was that back when people lived in houses? <laughs> now, what really infuriates me is that we are being marketed fear and misperceptions by people who want to just keep things the way they are. Um, they have a sea of money that they spend on distorting truth and keeping us all separated and divided. And these are the people that come up with attack ads in, in political campaigns. So I designed my own attack ad. Um, let's see if you can figure out who it's about. His chronic depression was never properly treated. A failure in business, he got rich as an opportunistic trial lawyer. His only political experience was one solitary term in Congress. While our troops were fighting to liberate California, he opposed the war. If he'd been in charge, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and San Francisco would belong to Mexico. Is this the man we want as commander-in-chief? Paid for by Mexican war veterans for truth. <laughs> now, every one of those statements is more or less accurate, but is it the truth about Abraham Lincoln? I don't think so. You know, Lincoln was a man who understood that perception was the key to moving ahead and aligning your perceptions with reality. He lived in a time when the, the country was literally being torn apart by people who had, er had erected an edifice of lies and mythology in order to support the institution of slavery. And Lincoln knew how to get past that. And he, this is how he the prescription he gave to us all. We must think anew and act anew. We must disenthrall ourselves, and then we shall save our country. I really like that word, disenthrall. 
Because to be enthralled is to be enslaved. To disenthrall is to liberate. And in all the years since I was in high school, I've, I've had a, a career of putting out my perceptions in front of thousands of people day after day and getting feedback day after day, not all of it very comfortable or polite. And it's been a good process. It's, it's caused me to think about, challenge my own perceptions, to disenthrall myself from a lot of ideas about politics and religion and personal relations and just the nature of the world. And in doing that, I've, I've been able to know when to say, I'm wrong. <laughs> and also to identify those, the effective ways to defend what I believe is truly right. So on a personal level, this, this process is great. It does work out if you, if you challenge yourself to think anew. The question I have is, is this something we can do as a society, as citizens of the United States? You know, we've made amazing progress in technology, in philanthropy, in business, in so many fields. But in politics, it seems like we're stuck about 150 years ago. Can we disenthrall ourselves from the merchants of fear? Can we think anew and act anew and find common ground? Can we identify the next big cow in the road? I don't know. I'm not sure if we can or not. What I'm sure of is that we need to try because, once again, we have a country to save. Thank you.